We heard so many angles, and now we want to take it to our next guest, which is Andy Tang from Draper University. Andy, are you out there? I'm waiting for Tech to put you on. Let me introduce Andy Tang. Um, I know everybody wanted to see Tim Draper. Tim had to be excused shortly before this meeting due to a family emergency. Andy Tang is his close associate. He is the managing director of um, the uh, Draper Dragon Fund, amongst a lot of other things. I think what's very interesting um, to make the bridge to the Metaverse DNA project is that Andy Tang is actually a specialist in connecting uh, USA economic uh, development in companies to the Chinese market. So he's very knowledgeable. He was born in Taiwan, so he speaks fluent Mandarin, which I don't speak. Sorry, Andy, it's not going to work this time. <laughs> I don't bring it further than how and say thank you in Chinese. Um, but I think um, Andy Tang is also uh, the CEO of Draper University. Uh, he also engages in um, um, as an investment partner in Draper and Associates. He's very well embedded in, I would say, growth markets. But I think one of the key drivers is what we took away from the analysis of our previous speaker, George, who was, of course, a fantastic university-based analyst, um, that he comes from a background in Cyprus, which is an enormous digital university. I know they run a course online free of charge that already enlisted 300,000 people just getting explained what is a blockchain, what is a cryptocurrency. I'm very happy to see you, Andy. I'm so thrilled that you took the opportunity to step in at the last page. We for sure have Tim on another occasion on one of our interviews. Um, I have to honestly commit that I don't know what you're going to talk about because the switch was made so shortly before this meeting. So I'm giving the floor to you, Andy. Uh, very much welcome Great. to you. Um, basically, we're very interested to the I would say the view that you have decentralized finance, especially yeah. into the growth markets in Southeast Asia. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just a technology check. Can you give me a thumbs up? You can hear me okay, clearly. Very good. Excellent. All right, good. Um, and also just logistics check. Um, we have about um, 20 minutes before the next speaker. Is that okay? Um, the next speaker is me, so I'll give you all the floor. Oh, then. great! <laughs> I'm I'm already immersed in the uh, all the wisdom of the next speaker. Excellent, great, um, good. So, um, I I had a few slides I prepared, but I'm having technical um, technical difficulty in sharing. So I will kind of just describe what I'm going to talk about very briefly. Perfectly so, fine. Uh, I'm already great, very yeah. grateful that you onboarded at such short notice. I know. It yeah, no. Just happens. Happy, happy to be here. Uh, Metaverse is a great partner of ours. We have um, been um, working with them um, for the last four years. Um, it, it truly is a wonderful uh, foundation. Uh, we think that um, um, the progress um, this community, this uh, cryptocurrency community, have made in the last four years is just amazing. Um, so I. I uh, the topic I would like to talk about today is um, decentralized finance and how it relates to global economy, uh, given the um, uncertainties uh, brought on by the pandemic, right? Um, you know, in the Chinese language, uh, the word for um, crisis um, is, the, is the same word as op opportunity, right? So we, we at Draper... Um, um, ecosystem truly believe that um, it, it's uh, actually very sad what has happened to humanity. But if you put that aside and say, how do we look forward? We truly are excited about the opportunity ahead of us, right? And it's abundant and it's beyond just blockchain. But I will focus on decentralized finance today. Um, as a first step, if you would indulge me to just describe to you what the Draper ecosystem is, so that would hopefully give you a bit more perspective of uh, the things I'm sharing with you. It's really based on wisdom of many people, not just Tim, not just myself, not just you know our partners, ten, over 10 partners in um, Silicon Valley, but it's over 50 investment partners around the world. So the yeah. Draper ecosystem has over... Um, 
25 funds globally, um, and we um, all engage in early stage investing. I didn't even know there were that many, Andy, to be honest. I know you're extremely active already, like longer than everybody wants to remember. Um, but I didn't know <laughs> how many. 25 is yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time signing each one of them, but I recognize the people by the faces. And <laughs> if you give me a city, if you give me a city in the world, more likely than not, um, let's say if you give me a city in the world that has an airport, more likely than not, we might have some sort of office there. Um, and then that is the idea we have in democratizing entrepreneurship, right? Um, George talked about democratizing um finance, banking the unbanked. Um, so, so we believe democratizing entrepreneurship would actually enable a lot of things such as um, blockchain, such as cryptocurrency, such as finance. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you about um, Draper and um, how we look at the history to project the past, right? So um, we have been investing in technology companies for the last 30 years. And there's one technology that stood out more than anything else that we think had transformed multiple industries, and that's internet. Internet has transformed telecom, it has transformed media entertainment, it has transformed um, communication, it transformed industrial, it transformed corporate software, and most recently, it has transformed financial services, right? And we believe this trend will continue, right? This is one technology, right? And internet as a technology kind of morphed into different things like share economy, right? Mobile technology. And most recently we see blockchain that in our mind is, is merely a um, transformation of internet taking to the next level, right? And I have this concept of a, uh, this blockchain revolution is really what I call an internet square because it's really the, um, the the, the uh, of two products right it's the computational power your computer gets faster and then your uh, wi-fi router gets faster right so communication and computing that's the fundamental of what enables um, blockchain right i think basically every one of you have a computer in your pocket right and that's your phone right and then this computational power is basically as powerful as a bank computer you know from 20, 30 years ago, right? And then the bandwidth you have here is as powerful as a you know um, broadband router of a bank, you know, from 10 I years come, ago. I come from the Korean monochrome screen, you know, the little small thingies. Like, <laughs> right. Computer. Well, I think it was 13.6 kilograms. <laughs> it was, you right. know. And now, now you're. Now you're getting your money worth in um, in these smaller I devices. So. Yes, yes, yeah. I would say so. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I think this is very exciting that you're packing all this technology. Essentially, each one of us can serve as a bank, right? So when that happens, many more opportunities open up, right? So, in this crisis, what we see is that um, it's forcing the speed of adoption. Right. And we're seeing this in other industries. We're seeing this in education, in healthcare. Right. Suddenly children are forced to stay home. So distance learning has been talked about for decades. Right. Even when Internet first came about, people talk about online schools, but it did not take off. But I, I tell you what, because of the crisis, distance learning will take off. Right. Yes. Healthcare. Right. The, Everybody's now a healthcare expert. We all know that a vaccine used to take four years, right? But now the new vaccine may take one year. Why? Because of the crisis. People are asking, why does it take four years? Can we shorten it? The, tr the answer is yes, right? The same thing is going to happen to blockchain. People are going to ask, why does it cost so much to bank? Why does it cost so much to send payment, right? It used to be, all right, let's let natural adoption take place in maybe 10, 20 years, blockchain completely take, become mainstream. But because of the crisis, there's a chance. And you're going to ask me, well, that's interesting because I could see education, I could see healthcare. That's very obvious because of pandemic. 
why blockchain? Why DeFi, right? And I'll tell you why. It has to do with government services, right? I talked about internet disrupting many industries. There's one industry that hasn't been disrupted, and that is government, right? It's government because it's regulated, right? So it's very difficult to dis disrupt the regulators. And I'm not proposing some some um, some overhauling, you know, the corp the uh, government political governance structure. So uh, so I'm actually not political at all. I'm I'm a I'm a technologist. I'm a business guy, right? So I look at commercialized adoption and funding companies. And my business, my trade, is investing in companies that have a working technology working product and i bet on their risk of getting commercially adopted right so i think government services may have a chance in the next 10 years and the reason why i say that is because of this government has become the biggest spender in the last three months right you see Absolutely. the us yes right right biggest spender right but if you have a biggest spender and the way they spend is by giving money to the constituents, to the citizens, so they could spend, right? It requires a very efficient system to disperse payment. If you look at the US, there's one example. There are other countries I'm not as familiar with, but just US as, as an opportunity, US government as an opportunity, the largest employer on earth, bigger than anything else, <laughs> largest employer, right? Incredible. Incredible. So do you think it has a good IT system? No. Right? I can tell you it doesn't. Probably it doesn't. not. Probably I think not. it's interesting that you just said that because Eric started out by explaining that the issuance of these checks that are going to be in the U.S., um, you know, specs for civilians, it's going to take them up to mid-July. Yeah, and by yeah. Then, you know, they're three months in the pandemic and they need it. You right, know? So, right. Yeah. In what world do you have a a um, vendor giving um, products to its um, customers and the lead time is three months? That, that In fact, that vendor will go out of business, right? The vendor will go out of business. Right? You're so right. But I think if you look at the possibilities that the government has for change, based upon the system that they have, change is going to be very slow. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did see change forced yeah. you said they, they they were forced to the speed of adoption of the pandemic yeah. we everywhere yeah. every government that was too late had to do something yeah. because crisis was on the doorstep and i think yeah. if you look at all these things that emerged from that it's a positive development yeah. do you think if you look back at to what eric said about digital identity about having a new way of communicating about i be, i would say owning data is going to be a major influence. I wouldn't say disruptive, but simplifying the government issue, like you know, extending your passion, expanding your opinion, um, maybe having yeah. I would say direct way of voting with your feet and now with your phone, basically by right, you know right. contributing whatever you have as an asset as value. Right, right. So uh, absolutely right. It it um, government structure was formed pre-computer, right? Um, and definitely pre-everyone having personal computers. And absolutely before everyone having mobile computers, right? So with every other industry that has been transformed, right? The taxi industry has been transformed. The phone industry has been transformed. We're seeing education is being transformed. We're seeing healthcare getting transformed. Right, we're seeing the financial services getting transformed. Right, previously unthinkable. I think it's a matter of time before government gets transformed. Now the question is, why does a pandemic serve as a catalyst for this? Right. So Eric pointed out the checks takes three months. Right. If you look at the checks that are being um, distributed, um, the social security systems or the small business administration. They are running on 40-year-old COBOL computers, right? So government used to be the most sophisticated technology user 40 years ago, right? 40 years ago, you didn't have a computer. I didn't have a computer, but they yeah. had a computer. But the problem is 
the rest of us have moved on and they kind of stayed, right? So um, I, I'm the first one to say, I think the citizens will push the government to change, right? The citizens will be fed up with the government and say, hey, I needed this check three months ago, right? And the politicians will gradually come up and say, all right, let's figure out a way to upgrade our IT system. And that's what I'm proposing. I'm not saying, you know, controversial things like, hey, maybe we should get rid of, uh, I mean, there, there are very controversial things I could think of. For instance, I don't need all the politicians because the, 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 the citizens could directly vote on issues and get rid of all the intermediaries, right? So, but I'm not proposing any of that. I'm going for the low-hanging fruit, and that is let's just adopt a, you know, a identity system like um, Eric was saying. Because government, what does it provide? It provides military, it provides road, it provides security, it provides insurance services, social security. It provides a government ID for identity. It provides a payment system. Let's go for the really non-controversial, low-hanging fruit, right? Um, the, the core government stuff, I don't want to touch because I think that would take a long time. But if I just replace a better payment system, better identity system for the government, a better computer system, that is a trillion dollar industry. That is the biggest the venture capital has ever seen, literally, because, if, you know. If, if, if you take that to emerging economies, which is, I would say, the largest, you know, population on the planet, let's be honest, mm -hmm. okay? Right. The further we leave them behind, the more problems that we have. That's my personal view. You know, if you got nothing yeah. to lose, you go to somewhere where there's more to be had, basically. Right. It's right. The major <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. I mean, yeah. I right. don't blame anybody for feeling that way about their family. I would feel probably right. the same if I was in that position. Yeah. So if you look at these, these, I would say, not say disruptive, but I would say evolving systems that under the influence of now the speed of this pandemic, which is inevitable. Yeah. I mean, you can't escape it. It's there. What do you see of the first opportunities these people have in value transmitting in systems and that? Where yeah. do you see the first, I would say, almost entrepreneurial angle to, to make this all work? Because yeah. actually entrepreneurs are going to be the bridge, right? They're going to be the bridge Absolutely. between change. Absolutely. So our, our prediction, we're very excited about entrepreneurship, especially in the time of crisis, change or transformation. I think after this pandemic, the post pandemic world, two types of companies survive. The ultra large companies with very strong balance sheet. And this is the Coca-Cola. This is the Harvard University. Right. Got big brand, lots of money. They're going to survive and they will survive regardless. They don't even make change. They'll survive. Right. And then on the other end, you have the really small ones. You have the two people and a, and a dog. These people will survive because they will adopt a change because the rule of the game will change, right? Suddenly, you know, just as basic as like a restaurant suddenly will be, will be run differently. Movie theater will be run differently, right? Hotels will be run differently. So if you are a mid-sized hotel chain or travel company, I think, and you don't change, right? You are too small you are too small to be able to weather a big storm, but you are too big to be nimble. You'll be driven out of business. That's why we're very bullish on small companies and entrepreneurs. And you mentioned entrepreneurs in the emerging market. We're excited. We're especially excited about that. And I'll tell you the reason why. The emerging market are kind of the places that they don't have the luxury to not change, right? Exactly. For instance, exactly so, my point. Right. So, so if I'm U.S. government, I'll just print nine trillion dollars and pump in the market, no problem, right? Because I'm the only game in town. I'm the reserve currency. There's, I'll just print. But if your island X Y Z, right? In my mind, your island X Y Z, you have no business in printing your own currency, right? As I said, a government's job is to supply military infrastructure, um, identity. Um, commerce, commerce is currency, but here's a problem, right? It's a IT, you're providing IT for, tr for transmitting um, e-commerce, right? But you're creating your own currency. That's a huge overhead. If you're a population of, I argue, if you're a population of less than 10 million people, it's not worth it for you to have your own currency because it's too expensive. The overhead is too high. The printing right? in itself is printing. already- Just the printing, yeah. And then imagine, mm -hmm. We recently Imagine. had 
the shift with the 500 euro bills, you know, we had, well, nobody liked them pretty much. So right. they the 500 euro bills for a lot of 100 euro bills. <laughs> that operation of shifting it costed 22 million euros just yeah. to change. I yeah. mean, so if you're a small country and you right. have like 5 million people, that's not doable. You, you can't. Right. Right. I was right. recently in Africa, in Gambia, and I had these these banknotes. I, they were hardly recognized. The, these right. countries are so poor, they can't even print these. Right, right. right. So it's, it's, it's basically like, um, I'll give you two examples. One is the, the telephone example. The companies who are too poor, they go directly to mobile phone, right? If yes. you're too poor to have your own currency, what, what do you do? Right, you you go, you get rid of the the lines. You, you go you go mobile. You go digital currency immediately. Now, while you add it, why stop at that? Why do you want to have your own Federal Reserve, your own central bank? So much work. If you're 10 million people, focus on something else you're good at. Right, outsource it. Right, you can maintain the control. Right, but then the technical implementation, outsource it to somebody. Right. Else to somebody, and th that's why, in our view, uh, if you look at cryptocurrency and blockchain, there are four different areas of focus. And I think in the pandemic, you'll see that the first area is store of value. As as countries print lots of money, right? You you will need certain asset to protect the value, right? So without without saying so, everybody would say it's Bitcoin. Great, it's Bitcoin, right? The second one is um, payment, right? Payment. You know, George talked about democratizing, you know, finance, banking, unbanked. All of that is just enabling people to trade, right? Most of the world, as you mentioned, you know, it's emerging market. It's simple people. People just want a commerce. They want to be able to trade a cow with an elephant and get a change, right? Because it's not a one-to-one -one trade. I need to get something back. Whether I get that back in local currency or I get it back in U.S. dollars or get it back in... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ethereum, uh, I don't care, right? They, they don't care, right? It's all abstract, right? Um, and then uh, and then the next one is trading, right? Um, so I think that uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, I, I, I like to joke, it's still a um, hobbyist um, um, casino right now, right? People are just kind of um, gambling their money. Right. So the biggest business in cryptocurrency right now is trading. Right. But I think it's a necessary first step for these people to make money and subsidize R&D for good applications. Once we find the killer applications, then the trading piece would actually become very small. At the moment, it's kind of the killer app, the most profitable app, but it's not a um, and, it, and it's not um, it's not healthy. Right. But I think it'll change. Right. And the fourth, I the, fourth the, more, yeah. the more use cases you will get. The exactly. more change you will see, yeah. and it's yeah. all depending on actual economic use cases mm -hmm. that people will adapt to. I mean, people will use things that are useful. That's the basics. Yeah. Of it. Absolutely, and, and then it will come. Yeah, it'll come, it's right? Next stage in blockchain. I'm convinced of that. Yes. Yeah, it'll, it'll come, right? It'll come. I mean, George talked about many um, mm -hmm. applications. So DeFi, DeFi is the one application that I see. You know, could be um, sort of that fourth area that we like. Um, you could provide some immediate value, right? So, for instance, you, in Europe, you have um, the German bonds are now negative yield, right? So <laughs> it's so hard. We talk to our investor. It's so hard to find yield, right? They want to find return, right? So you could potentially have create some financial products that create yield for people, right? You know, I already see the collateralized lending, for instance, right? That's a very common way to, you know, to to re 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 yeah. You know, look back at the crisis, you know, you were around in 2008 when everything, you know, went literally the other direction as we all wanted it. I mean, we saw that the volume due to Basel 1, 2 and 3 for lending in banks was dramatically reduced. We saw that, you know, because a loan of 10 million costs just as much work as a loan of $10,000 for the right. corporate job. Right. Right. We saw that whole market shrink tremendously with, you know, 75% was gone. And you saw yeah. this whole ICO thing, this whole, it started with crowdfunding, with basically sort of donation yeah. area, there were some tax uh, advantages, right. well, that whole thing emerged, and then of course we had the ICO boom, which was another corner. Do you think we are about to see something similar in the next stage of development of decentralized finance? Because 
As an individual, it's hard to get a bank account in Europe. It's hard to get loans. Do you see a similar development will stimulate this whole decentralized finance now because of the pandemic issues that the banks are seeing yeah. right now? I, I, I think, I think I've always believed that it's going to happen, right? So for my job is to make predictions. And I always cheat and I say, well, this is going to happen. But the, the real critical question is how long it takes. Because I could, I could make a prediction right now. I think DeFi is going to happen. It's, it's a matter of time. It will happen. It goes without saying. It's a natural evolution um, that you know the finance industry become more efficient. Uh, just like you know, some countries never had landline telephones. Some country may, you know, have a larger DeFi, you know, than um, than, than the U.S. Right? And so, so the question is how long? And I truly believe this pandemic is is causing governments worldwide to print money. And because of that, there are citizens, in some cases, will be forced to adopt the fi decentralized financing. I'll give an example of how I got convinced, right? I got, I got into Bitcoin in the 2013 timeframe, you know, bought it as a sort of a, a novelty, right? But in 2014, we made an investment in a company called um, Bitpagos. And this is a Latin American, I think it's an Argentinian company. Uh, they're basically the coin base of, uh, of Argentina, Ar Argentina. Through that company, I learned that there were people who were basically using Bitcoin to buy and sell, you know, vegetables and meat and produce in the grocery store, right? Because it was too expensive and too awkward to use U.S. notes. And their local currency was depreciating, right? So, so I think that's going to happen again. Why? Because government prints so much money, right? And I don't know which country or exactly when, but I think there's a ticking time bomb, just like 2008, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, 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 um, I was, I was going to say, if, if we're lucky, right? If we're unlucky, this will happen very quickly, right? This is a crisis. <laughs> In a way, it's, it's lucky for, it's lucky for blockchain <laughs> adoption, but, but unlucky yeah. for humanity, right? But I think it, it could happen very quickly. And it's a it's one of those things. If that happens to one or two countries, just watch. The press would make sure all the other citizens in the world know. And then people would look at blockchain once again. And you'll have that second adoption, right? And you'll find interesting killer apps, DeFi. And all the user UX UI issue would actually get, get solved over time. Because right now it's just, you know... Uh, techno geeks like like me who would use you know MetaMask and like th that no one is going to use that. But I think over time, um, as soon as the need comes, the UX UI will come. It'll, they'll come hand in hand. And some of the companies that don't do a good job, they'll get driven out of business, and that's okay. I think that's a very healthy situation. Um, you know, I think inefficiency and and lack of results, like in any situation, you know, get punished in the end. That's always the case. History will prove that. I want to thank you so much for your contribution, Andy. It's really appreciated you stepping in at the last minute and give us such a clear insight on your views on the future. I hope we can see you again in one of our other conferences. Absolutely. See how this development in decentralized finance, because. I feel like it's in a roller coaster right now since the pandemic started. Um, Europe was not awake in January when all this started. We were very late. Other areas in the world were even later. And now you see an immense roller coaster movement in the financial sector, in the banking, in the enormous debt creation that's going on. Uh, and we already had an enormous debt creation in Central Europe due to the fact that, you know, we were buying bonds together, 6,000 billion of it guys and we all have to pay back so yeah. how how this is all going to evolve it's going to have pressure i think on the economic possibilities for entrepreneurial growth so i think decentralized finance can play a very vital role in that whole development so i hope to see you sometime soon to talk some more Absolutely. about it because it's very very excited i think we are witnessing history in the making that's strongly my feeling about all this so I want to thank Absolutely. you so much, Andy. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.